Hey guys, this is Mr. Mahmood. Now I've already gone through the background of basic Mendelian genetics, and finally we're going to finish with something called dihybrid crosses, or basically crosses of multiple traits, doing more than one trait at a given time, how it does make it much more complex, but we'll walk about a couple of different ways of how to get to that answer. So let's get started. It is possible to actually follow more than one trait at once and make predictions about more than one trait at the same time. However, it gets a little more complex. For example, you see the Punnett square here that we're dealing with isn't my four box Punnett square that I was dealing with before. Now it's a 16 box Punnett square because with more traits comes more possibilities of combinations. And the key thing to focus in on here are the possible gametes. So let's talk about two different traits, whatever it is. Let's say hypothetically I was talking about a trait on the A and a trait on the B part of a chromosome, okay? Let's say the A trait, I'm not gonna follow my first letter rule here. Let's say the A trait represents eye color. So dominant is brown, brown eyes, and lowercase a represents the recessive or blue eyes, okay? And then let's say that the B trait represents hair color. So let's say the dominant B is black hair, and the recessive is, I don't know, blonde hair. Okay. All right, so if I'm not just worrying about one cross, but I'm actually following two traits at the same time, now I have to think differently in terms of what my possible gametes are for the offspring. So let's say that my two parents are both dihybrids. Di means two, hybrid means heterozygous. So if I have two parents that are both dihybrid for the trait, that means this is their genotype. Parent one and parent two are both dihybrid. That means the two traits are both heterozygous. Now, if this is true, I need to figure out what all of the possible gamete combinations can be. Now, be careful when you're doing this process. This is where most people mess up, is figuring out what the possible gametes are. You can't just split up the letters like you've been doing before. Because by definition, a gamete has to have two things. One, it has to be exactly half of the information of the parent, haploid instead of diploid. And two, every single trait that the parent has has to be represented in the, uh, in the gamete. So that means every gamete has to have, since the parent here is dealing with four alleles or four letters, every gamete has to have two letters, and every gamete has to represent each of the two traits. So every gamete has to have one A and one B. So what you're doing in figuring out the possible gametes are figuring out all the different ways each of these parents can give one A with one B. And to do this, there's a common math formula um, that you may hear of, or if you're in algebra, if you've had algebra recently, you may have heard of the FOIL system. If I give you something like this, x plus 1 times x minus 2 equals 0, and ask you to simplify that, you use something called the FOIL method. FOIL stands for first, outside, inside, and last. So you multiply the first of first value of each parentheses group, so you have x squared here, x times x, then O stands for outside, so this first x with the last position is a minus 2. Multiply that would be a minus 2x. Then inside would be these two here, plus 1x. And then the last one of each position, 1 times a negative 2, would be minus 2. And then you can simplify more and say x squared minus x minus 2 equals 0, and that's a simplified version of that formula. That's the FOIL method in algebra. You can do this with this process as well by looking at the gametes. So if I have an individual that's heterozygous A and heterozygous B, if we break it down into the same kind of parentheses that we use with the FOIL method, I can identify all the possible gametes. All the way I can get one A with one B. One possibility would be the first for each one. So I can have a capital A with a capital B. That's one possibility of a gamete. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and write that gamete up here at the top. And since I have the same parent here on the side that has the same one, that's one gamete possibility here as well. You can have the first of each one, capital A with a capital B. O stands for outside, so that means the first A and the last B, in this case would be a capital A with a lowercase b, is my second gamete possibility, so I'm going to go ahead and write that in. The third possibility would be inside for I, which would be the, the second A with the first B. In this case, a lowercase a with a capital B. I would normally tell you to put the capital letters first, but in this case, the order of the letters trumps the capital lowercase. So always put the A before B, or the, the first letter before the second. So that's my third possible gamete. So I have a lowercase a with a capital B for both parents. And then my last gamete possibility, L stands for last, so would be the last A 
of the last b, which in this case would be two lower cases. So that's my last gamete possibility. So remember, every gamete has to have half the number of the parent. So if the parent has four alleles, the gamete has to have two. It's haploid, it's half of the diploid. And every allele, or every trait, has to be represented. So that every gamete has to have one A with one B. Because remember, you're breaking down 23 chromosomes of information that you normally have two of, and every gamete's getting one of them. So if, if we were just following one trait, it was really easy because we had two alleles, so every gamete gets one. So you just split them up. But now that we're dealing with more than one trait, you have to make sure that every trait is represented and the overall gamete gets half the letters that the original had. One of each of the pairs has to get passed into that gamete. So make sure you're actually setting up your gametes properly. That's the most important part of this. Once you've made this, the rest of it's pretty easy. So now it's just a matter of putting your gametes together and all the different possibilities. And this is why we have 16 boxes of a Punnett square here, because now there are actually four possible gametes for each parent. So it depends on which gametes happen to combine. When you combine, follow the basic rules. Keep your A's together and your B's together. And then if you do have any heterozygotes, always put the capital letter before the set, before the lowercase. So we'll do the first couple here and then I'll just kind of fast forward to the end. So the first one here would be the first gamete combination for each one. So that would be two capital A's and two capital B's. So this individual is homozygous dominant for both. All right, so this is what I ended up with and you guys should end up with about the same thing. Now. In doing this cross, we can focus on all the different genotypic combinations and genotypic ratios, but in reality, there are way too many to worry about here. Usually when we're starting to talk about more than one trait at a time, all I care about is the phenotypic ratio, PR. And in this case, there are four possible phenotypic combinations because there are two traits combined, one of each. The first one, again, we go in order, is dominant for both, which in this case represents at least one dominant A and at least one dominant B. And that means, again, I don't really care what the second allele is for each group. As long as at least one of them is capital, they automatically show for the dominant trait. So my first phenotypic combinations would be brown eyes and black hair. That's dominant for both. The second possibility would be dominant for the first, but recessive for the second, which means both of the Bs have to be lowercase. This one would be brown eyes with blonde hair. The third would be recessive for the first, dominant for the second. This would be blue eyes with black hair, and the fourth would be recessive for both, which means all of the alleles have to be lowercase. This would be my blue eyed blonde hair individual. So as I go through here, I can identify which ones are which. So my phenotypic ratio of a dihybrid cross, and this is probably the only one you really have to memorize, so I would remember this phenotypic ratio. The phenotypic ratio of a dihybrid cross is 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 which means 9 out of the 16 will be dominant for both, 3 out of 16, so on and so on, and then only a 1 out of 16 chance to have offspring that are recessive for both traits when both parents are hybrids for both traits. Okay, so this ratio is important. Make sure you remember this. And make sure you can go through the basic process of figuring out the gametes for a parent and in turn doing the cross to identify all the possible offspring. Now there is a shortcut to this process, and I'm just going to show this to you briefly. Uh, you still have to be able to figure out the offspring in terms of the gametes from the parents and be able to work through that process, because the question could be just what are the possible gametes of a parent that has these two traits. Uh, so that doesn't give you permission to just forget what you saw on the last slide. However, I find this to be a much easier way to actually come up with the phenotypic ratio of any dihybrid cross or any kind of cross of two traits at all. Let's say we're doing the same cross. You're crossing two parents that are heterozygous for both traits, two dihybrids. Instead of actually worrying about it all at the same time, you can actually break them down individually. So that means I'm going to do two separate crosses. First, I'm going to worry about my A's crossing together, and then I'm going to worry about my B's crossing together. I'm going to do each one separately, and then I'll mathematically calculate them all out at the end. So if I'm just crossing two hybrids. I've already done this before. You guys should remember, you cross two hybrids, you get a 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio, but again, I don't care about genotype. All I care about is phenotypes here. Three out of these four will show for the dominant trait, right? And then only one will be homozygous recessive. So of this cross, I know for sure, of the four, three of them will be dominant, and one will be recessive, okay? Now understanding that, now let's focus in on the B's. I've done this B cross, it's the exact same cross as the A's, just with different letters, right? So I don't even need to worry about wasting time here. I know three of them are going to show for at least one dominant B, 
only one of them is going to be homozygous recessive. So that means for each one of these, for each one of these situations, when we talk about the different combinations that are possible, I can have three that are going to show for the dominant B for every one that's going to show for the recessive. Same thing's true here. For this one, I can have three that are going to show for the dominant for every one that's going to show for the recessive. So if you just multiply out, you'll get your phenotypic ratios without having to do the whole cross. So this follow, let's follow the first pattern here at the top. I'm dealing with dominant A and dominant B. Three times three, which means nine, are going to show for the dominant A and the dominant B. Then follow this pattern. Three times one means there are going to be three that show for the dominant A and the recessive B. You guys see how this is going to give you the exact same ratio. One times three gives me three that show for the recessive A and the dominant B. And finally, one times one, there's only one that's going to be recessive for everything. So I just got the same phenotypic ratio that I would have gotten had I done the whole calculation the other way. So this is a shortcut to skip having to worry about the 16 box Punnett square. If you just break down each individual cross, you can come up with the phenotypic ratio of your two traits. And you can do this with three traits, four traits, just keep branching off more as you go on. And you can continue to branch off. You can do tri-hybrid crosses here if you wanted to and give me all the different combinations of the three traits combining together. So this is a shortcut. You're welcome to use it if you'd like. But again, you, you can't just forget the last slide. You need to know how to be able to identify all the possible gametes for an individual parent because that could be a viable question as well. That's it, guys. That's it for genetics. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, take it all in, and I will see you next time.